OFC, or you can meet us on Zoom. Call the office 508-291-1595 to get the Zoom code if you don't already have it. Not something you want to miss. Make sure you're filling your cup up throughout the week. And now, here is Pastor Manny. Yeshua Shalom. It's a privilege and an honor to introduce the anointed man of God. The word of God says, many are called, a few are chosen. But this brother is truly chosen to preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the thing is that he's family, and that's the most important thing. We need each other. And he came here to give you a message that will lift your spirits. But no, it's strictly because of his anointing. Because of his anointing, it's from God, and he's led by God. So please, let's give an OFC welcome to Pastor Gino Fernandes. Check. God is good all the time. Oh, yeah. So I've preached in, in many churches on the Cape in the past decade, and just... I'm going to brag on you guys because I'm proud of you guys. It's just the level of excellency in this room is ridiculous. It's just unprecedented. I, I, I walk into this place and I could just see, you know, people, this guy's waiting on me. Hand and I'm like, if he asks me for one more thing, I'm going to have to pay him directly, right? <laughs> you guys are here, you know, praying early. You guys are here worshiping early. Uh, offered me the back room. So I'm like, all right, go in the back room and back... You sure you don't need me to walk you up front? I go to put on the lapel, and it's like, let me get your jacket for you. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then looking up here and seeing all of the, the, the worship team with all of the electronics. And I'm a technological guy. Like, I've been in technology for, like, the past 20 years. And I, I'm looking in the back room over there and just seeing how much you guys got back there. And I'm like, whoa, this is a lot to manage. One thing I'm going to say to you guys is do not grow weary in doing good. I know it's hard work. I understand. So sometimes we might feel like this is just too complicated. It's too much to do. But I'm telling you, Pastor GB has, he has put you guys in a place of excellency where your trust factor is much higher than most places. Okay, so God's blessings, they don't, they're not, they don't come through achievement. God's blessings come through trust. And if he can trust you, the more he can trust you, the more he can bring to you, right? We get edified when the harvest comes in. We get edified when souls are saved. That's, that's like one of the best things that could happen to our soul is to be in the presence of somebody who is being saved from the pits of hell. And you guys are, are being raised up in a position to be able to handle that. Amen? So don't, don't grow weary. I, I'm telling you, it's a lot of work, but you're there, and you built the tolerance. Your work ethic is, is great, and I, and I can see that you guys are going to do wonderful things for the kingdom. Actually, I'm going to pray for you guys directly on that right now. Father, I see the, the excellency, the skill level that you have placed upon your people here at OFC, Lord. And I'd ask that you just continue to give them the strength and continue to give them the spiritual gifts that they need to flow in your anointing. As this harvest comes to uh, Onset Foursquare, I, I pray that their hearts are ready. I pray that they're, they're not tired, but they're, they're ready to receive what you have for them, Lord. And I know that they're anticipating it. Lord, thank you for OFC. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right. So. I want you guys to go to the book of Ezekiel. We're going to look at chapter 18 today. And it's going to be verses 1 through 32. So I'm not going to cover that whole uh, chapter. Um, there's a lot there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to truncate it in a way where it doesn't take away from the message. 
So today I want to talk to you guys about generational sin. And, uh, you know, I know, how, I know how my cousin GB does it. He, he builds you guys up. And, and, and sometimes these messages are just, they're to build you up, build you up. But then sometimes the messages are also to eliminate some things that need to get out of there. So we got to have both. But I'm not going to leave you in a place where you're just like, oh, you know, I'm going to build you up at the end of this message. But I'm just going to let you know that uh, the word of the Lord, you know, sometimes it, it cuts. Uh, but just like my cousin GB says, I ain't going to kill you with it. <laughs> Does he tell you that? I ain't going to kill you with it. All right, so generational sin. What is generational sin? It's when sin gets passed down from generation to generation to generation. So it exists, right? Does everybody agree that it exists? How do we, how do we know it? We know it because we can see it. There's, there seems to be, in every family, this persona, in every family, this collective consciousness that we have, right? You could say, hey, you, you know those Fernandes, all oh, your Fernandes? Oh, I know those Fernandes, right? You could say, oh, the Gomes, oh, yeah, I know the Gomes, the Pyres, yeah, the Pyres, right? And we could go down the list, we all know each other, this is Ansa, we know each other, the K Verdians, we talk about each other, so we know, and there's a collective consciousness, there's that family persona. And usually people focus on those negative things. And those negative things, they can linger on for decades and decades. And unfortunately, sometimes those things can linger on for centuries. We look at our parents and our grandparents. We look at our, our children and our children's children. And we observe that we do tend to look the same, you know. I, I might have the same nose as my grandmother. My cousin has the same nose as me. You know, you might have the same hair color, the same eye color. So those, those character traits, I mean, those, those, excuse me, those genetic traits are there. But we also have those character traits that are there as well. You know, he's just like his father or, or she's just like her mother, right? And it spans generations. In a godly bloodline, though, a godly bloodline, you have that sturdy foundation of holiness, that virtue and faithfulness in that godly bloodline. But when the enemy, when hell is being raised up in the family, that's when we see things like anger, wrath, bitterness, lust, pride, yeah. greed, gluttony, sloth. It gets into the family. It breaks down the family. It hurts the family. But we cannot allow this to continue. We have to understand that this influence by our forefathers is just an influence. That's all it is. But God is more powerful than this. God can fix all of this. God wants to fix all of this. He wants to continue to work in the hearts of men and women, and he wants to make us holy because he understands that these generational sins are not from him. These generational sins are from the pits of hell. So we're going to send those generational sins back down to where they came from, and we're going to bring heaven down on earth because that's what we're here for. Amen? All right, let's do it. So the book of Ezekiel, chapter 18, verses 1 through 32 and when you get there, say amen. amen. All right. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start. And uh, as soon as I'm going to tell you break and I'm going to tell you where I'm going. Because I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just want you guys to follow. So I'm going to read some verses, say break, tell you the next verse I'm going to. And we'll just keep it going, all right? Amen. All right. Let me give you a little background, right? Uh Ezekiel, right? He, that, that name means the strength comes from the Lord, okay? So he uh, basically, he got taken into captivity in Babylon. So he's going through some things. You know, it's not, it's not all peaches and cream for him. He's going through uh, this, he's in this nation where, you know, they're looked at, the, the Israelites are looked down at. They're slaves in this, in this uh, place, uh, as far as, you know, they're as, far, as far as the uh, Babylonians are concerned, they're second-class citizens. Now, Ezekiel has to bring a word to them from God. So the people are already irritated in this situation. But now he's saying, hey, we're, we're, <laughs> we're going to have to deal with some things while we're here. We, we don't want to just allow these, these things to linger because God is telling me that we need to fix some things here. Even in the midst of this time of trials and tribulations, you know, where you're upset and you, and you don't feel good, you're not comfortable, right? We still, we, in this time, we need to do these, uh, we need to do this surgery. We need to allow God to fix these things. So... The word of the Lord, uh, verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me. 
What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The fathers have eaten uh, sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Okay, let's stop right there. So God's saying, you, you keep repeating this thing. You, you, you need to stop saying this thing. I don't want you to have this mindset. Right. So God works on that level. He says, I can't I can't have you continue to say things that are going to hurt other people. Right. So I need you to stop there. Now, this this uh, this saying is, you know, might be complicated because we don't really talk like this. But it says the fathers have eaten sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. So it's saying that the sins of the father are being felt by the children. And because the children are feeling this, they're 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 their teeth are like grinding. That's the sour grapes. But the Lord says, stop saying this. As I live, declares the Lord, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. The soul who sins shall die. If a man is righteous and does what is just and right, break to nine, walks in my statues and keeps my rules by acting faithfully he is righteous he shall surely live declares the lord you see that dichotomy there break to 19 yet you say why should not the son suffer for the iniquity of the father when the son has done what is just and right and has been careful to observe all my statues he shall surely live verse 20 the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not suffer for the iniquity of the father. So that term iniquity, right? Some people struggle with it, maybe haven't heard it before. But that term iniquity means that there's a bend, right? Because when temptation comes, when transgressions come, when sin comes, what happens is that gets acted out over and over and over. And it, tur- it, it, it turns people into a, a, a direction, a bend that, that matches that. And that's why you see that collective consciousness. That's why you see the families look the same. That pattern of behavior creates what's called iniquities, right? So that term iniquity of the father. Nor the, the father suffer for the iniquity of the son. So it's the other way around too, right? So you see that the son's doing, you know, dirt per se. And then what happens basically is the father says, ah, oh, you know, it's if he feels it on his shoulder. But God is saying, hey, you're not going to suffer for that, right? And, and, and he's not going to suffer for what you have done as far as eternal life is concerned in this case. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. And the wickedness of the wicked should be upon himself. Break to 30. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel. Everyone according to his ways, declares the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, lest iniquity be your ruin. Cast away from all the transgressions that you have committed and make yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, declares the Lord God. So turn and live Amen. the word of the Lord. Yes, sir. So we, we understand that there's, there's a presence of generational sin. We can see that, like I said, we can see that in the family. In the book of Exodus 25 and 6, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. See, he's jealous of you participating in things that demons are asking you to participate in because he wants you to participate in the goodness that he has for you, the righteousness that he has for you. He wants you to walk in his ways. So when we sin, when we transgress, when we trespass against our brother or sister, he gets jealous. So he says, I'm a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Somebody say, I don't hate God. Somebody say, I love God. All right. And for the ones who, but he's showing love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands. You understand? So see, this is the difference. And this is what we want. This is what we need in our lives. What we do matters to the generations beneath us what we do 
not only matters to our children and our children's children, but if you're an uncle, it matters to your, your nephews, right? It matters to the community because when the parents do something that is wrong, the children are very likely, the children are very likely to justify that same action. I can do it. You know, my, my dad, does, this is just who we are. This is, this is what we do, right? The vivid example of this is, is uh, about Adam's sin. In the book of Romans 5, 12, sin entered the world because one man sinned. And death came because of sin. Everyone sinned, so death came to all people. So we have this sinful nature. We have this Adamic nature, this part of us that we can't shake. The reason why we need the Holy Spirit, because this part of us is warring. We have the flesh, right? So we have to understand that it's, 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 it's a possibility that we can sin. It's a possibility that we can fall, even though we have the Holy Spirit in us. And the enemy is always digging at that flesh. The enemy is always trying to enter into that flesh. The flesh is on the outside. Then we have God's spirit and our spirit. He wants to penetrate. He wants to penetrate into that. The enemy wants to get into our spirit. So we recognize that. And we say, okay. So we, we, we live in a world that probably got on us. When I say collective consciousness, I'm talking about your inner man, your heart. So we recognize in your heart may be some or will be some impurities. And those impurities got on you. They got on you because of what's being done around you. So now we look and we say, okay, if that's the case, we need to recognize what is it? What is it? Put a label on it. So, so we, we talked about sloth. That's, that's just laziness. That could be on you. That's generational, right? We talk about gossip. That could be on you, right? Each and every single one of these things has an alternative spiritual blessing that God wants to give you. The exact opposite of this. But if we don't get rid of that, if we don't allow God to cleanse our heart and to release those impurities in our heart, then we can't operate in that spiritual gift because that impurity perverts that situation or the situations that we could be in. So let me give you an example. If you're gossiping, I can feel the anointing starting to kick in. You guys must be praying in the spirit. It, <laughs> if you're gossiping, your family's assignment was supposed to be to encourage. But the encouragement is not happening because the enemy is trying to steal that assignment. If you lie, your family was supposed to tell the truth. And Jesus says, I came into this world that you might know the truth. And the truth will set you free. You understand? If you steal, whoa, whoa, if you steal, you were supposed to be a giver. See, see, here's the thing. You don't get anything unless there's trust, unless somebody trusts you. So the enemy is trying to steal your trust. So now nobody wants to give you anything because you steal. But yet you could have been a conduit for what God wants to give. And he could have kept that flow going. We have to recognize those things. When you're at your family events, and I'm not saying, hey, look at, just look at the bad in your family. No, you got to look at the good. And I'm telling you, you got to look at the good more than you look at the bad because the enemy could use that. But when you're there, just observe and just realize there are going to be some things. So what you do is now you look at yourself. You look at your inner being and you look at, don't say, oh, because this, this, no, no, don't do it. Because they might not be in a position to receive that. Now, you could give radical candor. You could say very gently and, and, and very softly, softly. Maybe pull them aside and, and let them know. But before you do that, make sure you're working on yourself first. Because if you see it in them, most likely the reason why you see it is because it's probably in you. Yeah. 
But it has to end. And it has to end with you. So I know you love your nana. And I know you love your aunties and uncles and your cousins. But they need to see God in you. Before you can do anything to help them, you need to have that anointing upon you. You need to have those spiritual gifts in you. And listen, I'm telling you, if you think you could do this in your own strength, you're sadly mistaken. Once you allow God to eliminate those, I must just call them demons. See, see, I like it when I come to Onset Foursquare because I, I could just come right out because you, you guys are right there. You understand that demons are lurking. So I say, if I say demons in another church, they might be like, wait a minute, hold on one second. You know? <laughs> but you understand, those demons, people are taught by demons and they're there. But when those things are there, like I told you, you're not going to get those spiritual gifts. God, See, here's the thing. God does not want to give you influence if you're going to use it to raise hell. But he'll give you influence if you use it to build his kingdom. Okay? So once, once we eliminate those things, once we eliminate those things, then that's when he breathes those spiritual gifts in you. And I'm telling you, you have only so much energy to work with in a day. But when God eliminates those energy, energy draws, those things that shouldn't even be there. Right? Who had a generator on recently? Anybody? Tried, didn't work? So do we, when we have a generator running, do we plug in all kinds of things that we don't need? Because if we do that, what's going to happen, that, that, that generator will operate for eight hours at 50% load. But if it's 100% load, that might only operate for four hours. So you can't have those other iniquities, those other sins, those other demons, those other spirits in you vying for your life. Jesus says, I come to give more life. And that's the life he's referring to. Because once we eliminate these things, then Zoe, you lift up almost to an elevation state. That's the anointing. And then the gifts come. You know what I'm talking about? The gift of preaching. The gift of teaching, the gift of administration, hey, speaking in tongues. We, 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 the, the gifts just come. And before you know it, now when you use these gifts, you ever see somebody operate in their gifting? You see, so the guy, guy is good at basketball. That, he, that's a gift. He has hand-eye coordination. That's the reason why God will give you gifts. And then what happens is you're able to accomplish 5, 10, 20 times more than what you were able to accomplish without that gift. Now, if you start to recognize you're in a body, and if the body has the giftings too, whoa, now you have somebody with the same gift to, to work alongside and you guys can go a lot further because two is better than one. When one falls down, the other one is there to pick them up. You understand? And then you realize that God says, I want you to organize the intelligence in the room. I want you to organize the spiritual, supernatural intelligence in the room. And you're able to accomplish orders of magnitude more than if you didn't allow God to fix those generational sins. And I ain't even talking about what it's going to do for your family yet. We're going to talk about the church family. So now I'm going to take you down another, another corridor right here. This building, you know, inside of this building had a lot of people. But yet inside of them had a lot of spirits that didn't need to be there. So what happened was we came up in here <laughs> and we changed the setting. We changed the environment. So now this building has a whole lot of people with God's spirit in them. And God's spirit is perfect. So now all we have to do is look at God's spirit in our heart and find out what don't, find out what don't match. 
and say, God, we don't have to do anything. We just have to say, God, fix it. Create in me a clean heart, oh God. Like the antivirus. So now you got multiple programs running in your heart, your inner man, your being, who you are. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So you say, God, take the malware out. Work like that antivirus and get these things out of here. Now your family, at first, because <laughs> they know what's going on in their heart and they know exactly what happened you know, years before, before you got saved. So they might not know if it's real or not. They might, so you can't just get them right away. They're going to have to see years of you walking in this faith. They're going to have to see years of you not lying, not stealing. They're going to have to see years of you. They want to see that you broke free from that iniquity. And I'll tell you what, these family members are going to come to you in tears. They might, they might take personal jabs when the other family members are around, but when, but when you're alone with them, the Holy Spirit is going to press on them. The Holy Spirit press on them. And then they say, whoa, I'm observing the kingdom right now. Right? Some John 3 stuff, some Nicodemus stuff. Hey, listen. You, you, hey, Pooh, I, I know that. You say, Pooh, what's Pooh? I'm Pooh. <laughs> Pooh, I, I, I know that. You know, I joke around and stuff like this. But yeah, I'm really proud of you, man. I see, I see you doing your thing, man. This is real. This is, I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm seeing. I, I know, I know. I understand. Right? Because what is most important? The most important is the condition of your heart. When God chooses people, he doesn't choose the, the guy who is, the, I'm not saying he don't choose tall people, just me and GB are a little shorter. No. <laughs> so he chose, no, I'm just kidding. But you, so he doesn't just choose people for their stature, okay? We see, we, we look at um, when he chose David, when he went to Jesse's house, <laughs> when he went to Jesse's house, he said, yo, don't pick him just because he's tall. I pick him because of the contents of his heart. You understand? And that's what was most important to God. So we got to think of it, right? So they come to you and they say, well, maybe you might not be the most successful financially, but they understand that your heart is worth more than gold. Your heart is worth more than money. People in this world chase money because they feel like money is going to solve all their problems. But what they don't realize is that without fixing the contents of their heart, their heart is going to cause more problems. And then they're chasing and chasing, but they're chasing the money. So they're just using all of their time, effort, and energy in order to acquire more financial assets. What they don't realize is that that's a fool's errand. The Bible says that the wealth of the wicked is stored up for the righteous. So they're working for you. And it's your money. What they don't realize is that they're chasing this money, but what they're not passing down is holiness to their children and their children's children. So when you leave that inheritance to them, they could use it as a weapon, opposed to using it as something, a tool that could be used to build God's kingdom. So this is why we have to understand that it's just not about that. It is all, always, always about the heart. Regardless of what is happening in this world, it could be falling down. But God's going to purify your heart if you allow him to. And usually if you look in the, in the Bible, we'll just pick one, Numbers, right? The book of Numbers, uh, I think it's chapter 10, uh, chapter 10, chapter 20. In the book of Numbers, God brought his people to Kadesh. But Kadesh means holiness. But Kadesh was a desert. So he said, in the desert is where you get that holiness. In the, de in the, in the hard times is when that purification comes. So we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we know, hey, but we can't complain. Because if you complain, that's going to inject bitterness, anger. Wrath, jealousy, insecurity. No, 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 no. That desert is to purify you. 
in the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego was there with Jesus. Are you in the fire with Jesus? See, that's the thing. If you're in the fire, let Jesus point out those iniquities. Let Jesus say, these things got to go. But like, like I said, make sure you understand the opposite. Because once that iniquity is gone, the opposite is your spiritual gift. You understand? The opposite is your spiritual gift. The enemy wants you so bad, he's going to try to turn upside down and pervert whatever God has for you. You understand? That's exactly how you're supposed to operate. I'm thinking about our children and our children's children. The Bible says a thousand generations will be blessed. When we're on our deathbed, that's all we're going to care about. When we're on our deathbed, we're not going to care about all of the money we had, all of our financial ad. We're not going to care about that stuff. What we're going to care about is the, is the content of our children's heart. Why not start now? Why not work now? It just can't be on us, though. I'm, I'm, I'm helping you to understand that, yes, first, we need to recognize that there is generational sin, yes. Don't blame everybody. Just realize, hey, everybody got hit. We got it. Take personal responsibility because at this point, it's personal sin. If you're acting in a certain manner that's unholy, God's not blaming your family members or whoever taught you, right? He's, he's saying it's on you. It's taken away from your life. You're the one who's grieving the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is your source of joy. But yet, if you continue to do uh, the things that, uh, uh, that grieve the Holy Spirit, then you don't get joy from the Holy Spirit. And if you're walking around with your countenance down, remember the Bible said, to, uh, the, God said to Cain, he says, hey, why are your countenance down? And he said, uh, 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 well, it's, it's because, what did he say? It's because of the, the situation with him and his brother. But God said, be careful. Because when your countenance is down, this is when the enemy comes in. When your countenance is down, this is when the enemy comes in. The spirit of depression. So when you have that spirit of depression, remember I told you the opposite of that would be what? To encourage So the enemy is trying to keep you there so you can't encourage. It's on you, though, if you continue down the road of wrath and bitterness and envy. And here's the thing. <clears throat> These demonic forces, they're cousins. So when one's there, you, you, heard, you heard the Bible say that when, when the house was cleaned, seven of them came back even stronger. So they roll like a family, too. Rank demons, too. So if you let the little cousin in, the uncle might come in, yeah. and the uncle is a lot stronger. So it starts off, oh, it's just, you know, I'm just a little insecure. You know, I, I just, you know, woe is me. I'm kind of I'm kind of jealous of other people when they get what they get, you know. Then it turns into, uh, I hate it when people, they call this schadenfreude. I hate it when people get stuff. I want something bad to happen to that person. And then you start to clap up when somebody, something bad happens to somebody. <laughs> you, guys, you guys have a little, little thing going on. <laughs> and then you start to clap up. Oh, then it turns into envy. Then when something bad doesn't happen, see, you got to understand the uncle is murder. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And murder is a hard one to get out of the bloodline. It's a hard one to get out of the family. You understand? So the stronger the demons, the stronger the iniquity. But you got to take personal responsibility for yourself. You can't help anybody until it's fixed in you. But I'll tell you what, once it's fixed in you, you're the light. They just need the programming, just like everybody is programmed. But they need to see the programming working in you. They act upon the programming that they have because that's a default program. But then you come with the, with the new program and you say, this one works a lot better. You don't need to use that broken malware program that destroys your life. You could use this holiness program that brings life. 
right? So we take personal responsibility. But like I said, we, we can't do it on our own. We need to do it with Jesus. We need to do it with God. Because if you think that you're going to fight these demons without God, remember in the Bible, these dudes came to try to cast out demons, and they end up running away naked. The demons beat them down, pop, 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 whopped them up. So, <laughs> so we acknowledge it, but then we repent. Repent. So what does it mean to repent? It doesn't just mean, I'm sorry, God. No, it means God crying out to God. Please, God. Not, not only just for yourself, but God, forgive my father. Forgive my grandfather. Forgive my cousins. Forgive them, Lord. We see in the scripture where uh, I think it was, um, it was, was it Noah? Hold on. I'm not really, no, he's like, yeah, it was Noah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even have the story yet uh, where <laughs> I got you so it, it, was, it was actually Job I was thinking about <laughs> I could use Noah though we might as well now right <laughs> uh, but so it was, it was Job when Job, Job was the richest man in the east but what he did was he ended up sacrificing for his children because he knew that his children was partying a little bit too much maybe a lot of it too much so he did the sacrifice. This is the thing. We need to be to the point where we're crying out for our whole family. You understand? We, and then and, and get this. Once you start to learn how to cry out for your whole family, then you cry out for the community. And if you cry out for the community, that's when, listen, I'm telling you, God says, you know what? It's to the point where he's the one where I want these people to come to. Because he knows that you're not just in it just to be seen anymore. You're not just in it just to look like you're making achievements. You're not just in it just to, just to look like I went to church and I'm checking the box. He's like, and I'm telling you, that term preacher means crier. So if you begin preaching, God is going to make you cry before you get into that pulpit. You're going to feel exact, you're going to feel exactly what it feels like to not get the message to the people. And that's how you know that you're in the state that God wants you to be in. Because you could feel it. When you're in that state, that's when the Holy Spirit can flow through and you don't need to sit there and read. Right? Because he says, all right, I got you. I'm prim I primed the pump, so I'm going to bring it through. So that's exactly why you need to be in a crying state for your family. Because if you're in that crying state for your, for your family, the Holy Spirit gives you the words to say to them. You don't have to think, what do I have to say? I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I just want my family to be better. But then you just relax and rest. You can stand there with the stature and just rest. And the Holy Spirit will give you exactly what they need. Not, not so much where you just take it on your own and just pour out. And then before you know, it's an argument. How many of you have been in that situation? You don't want to do it. The Holy Spirit says, they ain't ready for all of it yet. They're not exactly where you are. You know, you've been reading the word. You've been in the word. So they don't understand what you understand. The word of God says that my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. So they're not going to be able to accept everything that you give to them right away. But if you're at a place where you cry out, God's going to give you the patience to say, all right, you can deal with this. The tolerance and then the timing, before you know it, there's going to be something that happens. You're in the family's presence, and then God says, and they're in the state. Remember how I said, when things get tough, that's when God starts to work. If things are going flying high and you're out there, you know, they might not listen to you. But things get tough, that's when they come to you and say, you know what, hey, I feel like the Lord is, is, is asking me to do this. I feel like God is drawing me in to this, and, and because the contents of your heart is right, they trust you more than they trust anybody else. And they're willing, just like how Nicodemus said to Jesus, listen, I know that you're from God. I mean, I could tell. These other guys, they know the word, they understand it, but the contents of their heart isn't right. So I don't even really trust them to talk on this level. And that's where God wants you to talk, on that low level, on that level bare metal Holy Spirit to the soul, right? And that's when you can get it. You can get it in, right? So we cry out. We cry out for ourselves. God, fix this, right? I had enough. I'm tired of cursing. 
I don't want to swear all the time. This is a problem. Like I'm tired, of, I'm tired of lying to people. I don't know why. It just comes. I, all of a sudden, I just lie to people. Then nobody's going to trust me, right? I can't. I'm bitter. My face. All the time, right? I put on a suit. and <laughs> I put on a suit, and I'm like, I look in the mirror. I'm like, yo, I look good from here down. But <laughs> up here, I'm just like, <laughs> what's going on with that dude, right? I just can't. Like, whenever I, my cousin comes around, I can't be around my cousin because he's doing too good. It's making me look bad. No, you got to fix that. No, I, I, I want to encourage my cousin. Hey, I, maybe he is the way that the family is going to be blessed. Okay? So, so maybe he, God is going to bless him with the appropriate understanding of the use of money, and maybe he's going to become, he's going to utilize the, that, those funds to be the father of the fatherless. Or, or to be, maybe he's going to be uh, 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 the, the husband to the husbandless. Remember, the orphans and, and the widows, they have to be taken care of, right? So maybe he's going to be a conduit for that. Or maybe he might write the check for a church that's going to get planted. I can't just sit here and, and be jealous of this person because this person is doing better. So God, cry out, God, help me to encourage him. Help me to congratulate him. So, so oh, if, if you can't go to the, the, the graduation party because you feel like your education isn't um, up to par, that's a problem. You can't congratulate that person because that person's younger and that person looks like they might be doing better. See, we got we to gotta fix this. If you're stealing it, you can't steal no more. So we cry out, God, please take it from me. Why? Because it isn't me. This is, this is not me. I, when, I, when, I, when I asked you to come into my heart, you sent me the Holy Spirit, but yet this stuff is still here, God. Take it away. I don't want it anymore. I want to be holy because righteousness is the only way that I can feel good in this life. Because every time I fall, it hurts me. It's temporary satisfaction, but then I feel so alone and so away from you, God. So cry out, please. And if you know how it feels, we're all human beings. They feel the same way. Those filters only filter the face. They don't filter the heart. So when they're posting all those pictures and they're trying to show you that everything appears to be good, what's really going on in their heart? So we cry out for them too. So, oh, they're sinning. So you're mad at them because they're getting in the way. Like, they're, they're taking my resources. I work so hard. I don't have enough. For the, they're wasting everything, right? Pray for them. Pray that God enters into their heart because you know that they're in the family and you know that that family is going to be, that family, that generational sin is going to pass down there. And then you're going to see that their kids grow up and they have those same bends. Pray for them. Cry out to them. And when you start to do that, that's when this community is going to say, whoa, these people care about people. They love people who hate them. Wow. Why are they so different? And then you could say, the reason why I'm different is because Jesus. Because Jesus came into my heart. Because Jesus is cleansing my heart. Listen, the stuff that was in there, that, that, that had to go. But I didn't even do anything to get rid of it. He just did it. He just fixed me. And now I'm so grateful. I just want to praise him every single day. <laughs> Hallelujah. Like, oh, my goodness. And, I, and I've never felt this way. I've never felt this way before. But now people look at me and they say, you, he's crazy. Look at him. He's running up and down the, the aisles of the church. And be like, why? Because he's free. He's free from sin. Romans 13, 14 says, let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, the Lord says that was happening in this building, but now it's gone. When this place was a club, that's what this place was for. Not in dissension and jealousy, rather close your, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the fleshly desires. 
Let me say that again. Rather, clothe yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. The flesh is on the outside. Holy Spirit is on the inside and our inner spirit is there. We clothe ourselves with the Holy Spirit. Wear that. Wear the Holy Spirit. Don't let the flesh penetrate. Allow God to continue. See, he's there working. Allow him to work on your spirit. Allow him to make the changes because we can do better. We could always do better. Jesus is perfect. And the Bible says, be perfect because I am perfect. But, and I get it. It's like, well, I can't be perfect. Yes, you can. The perfection is a mode. It's called sanctification. It's a mode. It doesn't mean that you're not going to drop the ball. You're not going to miss. Listen, when you cry, Abba, Father, what you're crying out is you're saying, be my master. Help me to be obedient. That's what Abba, Father means. And he says, okay, I got you. Because he knows that this world is getting in you. But he says, I'm going to continue to clean you. I'm going to continue. So that's the state you need to be in. That's the perfection that we need to be in. Jesus said in John 8, 34 and 36, very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Why do we want to go back to slavery? Why do we want to go back to Egypt? You understand? Is a slave to sin. You can't fix the sin without Jesus. But if you hold on to the sin, then you're enslaved by the, by the sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family. This is Jesus. But a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let us pray. <sighs> Father, we, we, we're in awe of you. How can one be so holy? We see so much in this world that is not like you. But Lord, we want to see so much in us that is like you. Because that's what satisfies the soul. I can't even believe that you even think of us on that level. Does anybody actually care about us on that level right. to the point where they would actually die for us that they might live in us and fix us underneath where nobody sees? So amazing. But I understand exactly why you're doing it. You're doing it to preserve us and you're doing it to preserve your world. So, Lord, I'm all for it. And this is honestly, this first and foremost.
And we're going to call the prayer team up here, the pastors up here. If there's anything, if there's anything that you're holding on to, today is the day to release it. Today is the day to let go and let God do what he wants to do in you. To let go of the things that have been holding you back. Because if we're continually holding on to them things, it's hindering us from where God wants us to go. And God is so good that he sent his son to take the weight of the world upon his shoulders. That you and I that are gathered here today that are watching on live stream, watching on Facebook live, can be free because of the blood of Jesus. Just come. Come before we leave the sanctuary. The Holy Spirit is here to move in the hearts of his people. See, the Bible tells us that God says, I, I know the thoughts and the attitudes of your heart. See, he's the all-knowing God, the all-present God. The Almighty God, the one who's able to forgive. And we'll be here to pray for you if you need prayer. But if we can just stand to our feet before we leave here, we thank God for who he is. We thank God for the man of God who came and delivered his word today. Lord, we ask you right now in the mighty name of Jesus, O oh God, that you continue to bless him, anoint him, O oh God, as you called him for such a time as this to go forth and share the gospel. We heard the gospel message that Jesus Christ came to set you free. So, Lord, as we go from this place, Lord, that word that was implanted today, God, let that word take root in us, O oh God. That, Lord, that you start here with me, with us, O oh God, and change us, O oh God. Take out anything that is not of you in us, O oh God. That, Lord, that we can be the light on the hill that will draw, will be people will be drawn to, O oh God. Not only our friends, not only our family, but that the world will know that there is something different about that person, O oh God. that I may have known them when they were doing their thing, but Lord, there's something different about them now. Something changed in their life. And the word is nearer to your mouth than it, it, you think. It's Jesus. It's the Jesus that lives in me. It's the Jesus that lives in us. That Lord, that we can be the vessels that you can use to share this gospel. So, Lord, we thank you for who you are. Heavenly Father, we thank you that even in this gathering, O oh God, that you remove some things that weren't of you, O oh God. But, Lord, we know that there's more work to be done in us. So, Lord, we cry out to you. We cry out to you, Lord, and say, do it, Lord. Do it now, Lord. As you, we walk with you, we thank you that you never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, we just ask for travel and mercy that we go from here, O oh God. But Lord, that this word stays planted on our hearts. To God be the glory. In Jesus' name, amen.